You're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Anna Sale. This is my first episode guest hosting It's Been a Minute, and I'm so excited to be here. I'm usually the host of WNYC's Death, Sex, and Money, an interview podcast about the things we think about a lot and need to talk about more, things that are taboo. Which is why it is fitting that my first episode here is filled with taboo. And a warning, that means this conversation might not be suitable for all listeners. It contains a frank discussion about sex, including kink, domination, and sex acts that include some violence. We are talking about a new novel called X. If you were describing the book to someone unfamiliar with the particulars of the scene and the world that this book inhabits, how, do you, how would you describe this novel? Okay, the short version of that is dyke drama. <laughs> That's Davy Davis, the author of X. It's a noir quasi-mystery set in the Brooklyn queer BDSM scene. X is about a person named Lee who lives in New York. They are a lifestyle sadist, so they're into SM and a chance encounter with a mysterious person named X kind of takes them on this treasure hunt. But this treasure hunt isn't as fun as it sounds. Lee has to find X before the government moves her out of the country. In the world of this book, that's a threat that sex workers, trans people, and immigrants in the scene live under. They're trying to find them again before they are exported because the U.S. government is in the process of exporting undesirable people. So this is a dystopian novel about freedom and rights in America and pleasure and sex, all the things we've been talking about a lot lately as the country has digested the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe versus Wade. But this story reframes those tensions and locates them not in courts or abortion clinics, but in queer clubs and BDSM dungeons. Enjoy. In your mind, when was this happening? When is this book unfolding? I I think of it as kind of, honestly, just like an alternate version of right now. I was actually inspired that the exporting thing was something that I came across while reading Christopher Isherwood writing about the Weimar, uh, like the kind of queer underground culture of the Weimar Republic in Germany. Hmm. So there is definitely like a precedent for encouraging undesirable populations to leave, which is what what the German government was doing at the beginning of its extermination mm. program. So I, I just lifted that from that kind of context. And to me, what I'm really interested in is parallel routes of government austerity and uh, oppression and how those can kind of look different at any given time. Hmm. And it's kind of amazing how quickly these things can change, as I think all of us are thinking about after uh, last week. You mean the overturning Roe versus Wade? We're, we're yes. speaking the week after yeah. that court decision came out. Y- you have called this book your love letter to sadists. And <laughs> I... Why did you want to write a love letter to sadists? What did you want to describe and celebrate about what happens in these interactions? I love that question. I'm glad you noticed that. First of all, because I think that when we're talking about like the pathologization of I, what people mostly now call BDSM, I, I feel like the focus is more on the masochist, right? Like no one can really understand why they would want to do something that is scary and painful and challenging to their body, even though no one questions why someone would want to give birth or climb a mountain, right? <laughs> Those are all kind of, they, they hit a lot of the same marks for people. No one really spends too much time thinking about the sadist because somebody who hurts people is already criminalized, already deviant. And, you know, obviously I'm not a person who thinks that that's the case for uh, consensual interactions between people who are looking for an intense experience, um, an erotic experience, a romantic experience. I think sadists are very romantic. Tell me more about that. (laughs) Well, (laughs) what is romance? Romance is a big, glamorous, sweeping, sexy feeling that you're sharing with another person. And and it is very romantic to like love somebody or be so attracted to somebody that you'll go to this limit with them, you know. And it's it's kind of like 
you know, when you see a kitten and it's so cute and you just want to squeeze it and you could just eat it and put it in your mouth. Ah. Like it, to me, that's like a, on that kind of wavelength. You know what I mean? You're like, ah, you're just so sexy. I want to kind of destroy you, but not really, but maybe. Uh (laughs) And how did you like get to know that world? How did you get to know how to be with a kitten and the boundaries you could push with a kitten in the context of a, (laughs) a sexy and not dangerous environment. I came onto like the queer scene in the Bay Area when I was younger and it has all of these, you know, very close t- ties to leather um, and leather and queer community and sex work community are all very much intertwined. So for me, it just was a part of growing up and becoming an adult gay person. Um, and there is an incredible political community in the Bay as well and in here in New York. Um, So that's just my people. It's always been my people. I love the way you answer that because that is, that's the sense that I got reading this novel, the way that characters sort of showed up at different places by first name. You get the sense of like who's, who's dated whom, who slept with whom, who's had an experience with whom. You get a sense of the drama and the gossip. Um, and I really felt like I was sort of inhabiting a community while I was in this world of this book. Um, and, and I wanted, I was curious how you thought about creating that sense because it's a first person narrated novel, but I really felt like I was getting to know a scene. I think if you recognize it, you're already in your, yourself in some kind of scene or community, right? And it, it becomes, it's so part of your atmosphere that you don't even really think about it. And I mean, I don't know if, if this is an experience for you, but it's like that, it's a cliche about being gay, right? Such a small world, you know, everybody, straight people are like, oh, do you know each other from being gay? And we're like, no, but we're kind of like a little bit, <laughs> you know, like oh, we all of us know each other. And, and that field gets even smaller when you're trans um, or, you know, have any other aspect of your identity where you're connecting with other people like you. So it can be a really good thing. It can be a really bad thing, but it's definitely a thing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Coming up, Davey on the politics of likability. Stay with us. Part of what the plot explores, the narrator, Lee, has long been a top, has long been um, in interactions, the one who is kind of holding the power, um, kind of pushing the lines of pain. And the experience that Lee finds so intoxicating with this character, X, they're in the totally different position of being out of control. And that felt dangerous, and that also felt very like something they wanted more of. Why did you want to explore that, this shifting of roles? Part of what was in the beginning of thinking about making this book was a a friend and I were getting really frustrated with this thing we called the top box, (laughs) which is when, and I should be clear that a top and a sadist, right, are often go together, but aren't always the same thing, right? A sadist likes to hurt people, and a top is, in the words, a, a, an old expression is running the f- right? <laughs> They're the person who's in charge. And because of the way that gender and power work in our society and aesthetically how people associate, how people present their genders with power, there is this association that if you're masculine of center or transmasculine, that you will be the top. And my friend and I were always like, this feels like we're always hitting a wall where we get these people thinking that we're going to do this for them. Even within the queer and trans communities, we, you know, cis heteronormativity affects us, homonormativity affects us as well. As we're talking, my friend and I are talking about the top box. I'm like, well, what if we have a person who is stuck in their own top box and kind of through their own efforts and kind of not how they're how they're brought out of it. It's not the whole story, but that was kind of the kernel, you know? Getting outside the top box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Breaking free. <laughs> That's interesting. And this way of like, well, what happens? Why, why was that interesting to you? What happens outside the top box? Because the whole point or the, the whole pleasure of not being straight is you're supposed to be able to do what you want and pursue whatever pleasure it is that you 
that you want and feels good to you. Of course, with everyone being involved, also being on the same page. And it's pretty wild how those same scripts that we're supposed to be breaking through of are still so seductive or still so powerful that um, we can easily find ourselves reinscribing them or being trapped in them. Mm -hmm. Along with the eroticism of pain, I was struck how much there was stuffing away of feelings in the novel. Mm. (laughs) Um, There is a lot of cutting off, blocking people on phones, um, being done with a relationship and ghosting. Um, And I wonder if you think of that as somehow like the other side of the pain spectrum. Like, I don't, I don't want to feel this anymore. I'm cutting this off. I'm numbing this. Um, Mm. Because I, it was alongside such extreme sensation. Yeah. Well, I think looked at a certain way, it's the same thing, you know, like high intensity, sensation can be numbing. It can be an escape. It can be turning off and checking out. And the thing about SM, everybody in the community is like communication first. It is all about talking. It is all about getting inside the other person's head. It's about being real with people. It's about um, really honestly evaluating and talking about the risks that you're taking because it is risky. It can be really dangerous. You're taking part in that on purpose. You know, we say that that's the ideal, but not everybody is a great communicator. I know I definitely haven't been, and I probably will continue to not be the world's best communicator. And so to me, there is an element of hypocrisy there with somebody, right? Where we're supposed to have this like extremely raw, extremely straightforward exchange with each other. But at the same time, if if I get overwhelmed, I might just block you and not talk to you. <laughs> and the internet and phones, right? That makes that so easy for us to not have that actual human-to-human encounter. So I was kind of having fun playing with the contrast between those two things. Yeah. I mean, and it's kind of bold because to make such a sort of intimate um, portrayal of this of, of, of a scene that you that's part of your life and then to also kind of play with its hypocrisies and the parts of it that aren't always behaving the way in which they aspire to behave. It's bold. I, well, that's good. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of pressure in any subculture, right, to be um, the good ones or the ones who are the most normal or the ones that who can assimilate or a good, good, um, a good example. And I'm really against that. I'm really against being like the example that straight people or people, more normative people are pointing to and they're like, okay, this is the good one. This is the salvageable one. It's the, it's the bad ones. It's the pervert ones. Those are the ones that are the problem. Like anytime you fall into that line of discourse, you've already lost, right? You're conceding to the other side. Um, and I don't think that that's makes sense as, um, any kind of strategy for building power and liberation for, for erotic and sexual freedom. Hmm. So unlikable characters are a political statement. Yeah, and it's not art if it's one-dimensional or if it could easily become, you know, a press release. That's not interesting, and it's not real. Mm-hmm. I want to understand how you sort of thought up this um, process of exportation in the book, in the world of this book. You said it draws on the historical example of, of what was happening in Nazi Germany. Um, when it first appears in your novel, the narrator Lee and their friends treat their first friend who's exporting as sort of a celebration. There's like this caravan uh, of farewell to the airport to send their friend off. Um, and it sort of almost feels like it's this kind of joyful opting out of a society that doesn't want you. And when, in fact, it's the beginning of a cultural cleansing program, were you trying to capture an ambivalence there about about living in a place that doesn't want you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of that line between, you know, being like, oh, well, defiance, right? Like, well, f- you, I didn't want to be here anyway, or I'm going to figure out figure it out, you know, outside of you and beyond you. But I also wanted to, I'm, I'm very interested in bureaucracy, right? In the ways that, you know, like as a, as a trans person, you recognize that while well, a lot of the time there is, you know, overt discrimination in, in going to the doctor and getting, you know, 
uh, dealing with police or whatever, there's also a lot of stuff that happens just because the system doesn't fit you and was not made to serve you and has overlooked you. My kind of vision for the development of this exporting system is watching it cause everything else to kind of crumble under it. And so everybody who is affected by it is slowly brought into this austerity that kind of like, it's like metastasizing, like a cancer, you know? So it's attrition, right? Mm. And defiance is one thing at the beginning, but over time it gets a lot harder to fight. And that's how, that's why it works, right? That's why austerity works. Mm Mm-hmm. And in moments, it's almost like a sense of fantasy. Like there's a moment in the book where Lee, the narrator, is feeling uh, mournful that they dropped out of college and didn't have a degree and maybe they could export to a desirable country if they had the right credentials. Yeah. I mean, that's what you, you, in the face of something like that, you're like, for so many of us, the first thing you do is you're like, okay, like my, you know, the fantasy is that you can control it or that there's some way that you can make it work for you. And oftentimes that's more appealing than being like, okay, what are we as a community going to do about it? You know, it's, it's a lot easier to be more um, individualistic and just be like, all right, I'm going to have a little daydream about how this will all be fine, even though it probably won't. How I can make this work out for me, if not for, for society. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very seductive. Yeah. Um, the writer Sarah Schulman actually wrote on Goodreads, I loved this comment about you and your book. They unflinchingly draw taut the tightrope between ego aggression and political passivity that so many live on. Um, and I I loved that idea like because that is the, the feeling I had. This the, You have a sense that the narrator has this disgust with what's happening, but also it's passive and without a sense of alarm. It just is. Mm. You know, I think Sarah's amazing and her ability to kind of zoom in on that is like, you know, chef's kiss. I was like, yes, exactly. <laughs> like this person in the, my, my protagonist, Lee, I keep using this word over and over, I'm sorry, but it's so seductive to kind of look at the wall of terror that that they're that is coming at them and to just kind of give up or you know flip it off or otherwise allow that sense of that passivity to overtake you and it's very um understandable why somebody would do that um but I don't think it's the way and I I would think that Sarah would agree with me on that Mm -hmm. I think Sarah Shulman of all people (laughs) (laughs) yes (laughs) Up next, Davy on preserving the humanity of their characters, even when they behave badly. Stick around. So we spend this novel inside the head of one person, Lee, and we learn about the physical abuse they experienced as kid, as a kid from their mother, their difficult relationship with their mother into adulthood, and up through the book's present um, as they search for this character, X, who dominated them and this 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 desperate zeal that that Lee feels to find X again for some sort of salvation. And so you present this backstory that Lee is carrying around with them. And then you also throw this curveball about how much backstory can even explain who we are. I was really struck by it. I, I um, have a big bracket in the margin around it. Um, you write, of course, people only ask this question, why are you the way you are? Because the answer is also a solution. If there's a way to turn people into murderers, then there must also be a way to turn them back, to fix people, whether it's by hacking their genes or raising them in safety helmets. Personally, I can't decide who's worse, the people who think circumstance is the whole story or the people who think born this way actually mean something. What were you trying to get at there? There is this idea that based either, you know, either something happened to you as a kid and that's why you're bad or you were born with this certain genetic configuration and that's why you're bad. And in both instances, you've basically taken a, a person and eliminated all of their choices and all of their agency. And you, you have decided that a certain kind of person is evil and not their behavior. And Whether you're, I mean, you know, searching for the gay gene or the trans gene, right, to me is just kind of an extension of that. And 
I don't think that either of those things are possible, but even if they were, I don't see how a search for it would mean anything good <laughs> for, for queer people or trans people. I'm a big believer in judging people based on their behavior. And, 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 I, and a big part of my purpose with this book was to talk about violence in a way that does not automatically assume that any particular kind of person is violent. And as a masculine, dyke, transsexual, sadist, Lee is the kind of person that is automatically viewed as predatory and dangerous and violent, which is complicated because sometimes they can be violent and sometimes they can be predatory. But that's, I think, most people, if not all people. So I, I, like, I like to complicate things. <laughs> There are instances in the book, a few, where the narrator alludes to having a thought that they think they ought not to have. There's a moment where the, the narrator says, oh, I might be thinking something that's a violation of the queer theory paradigm, or they're having a thought about gender that feels bioessentialist um, when it comes to gender. And as I was reading, I was thinking, um, I was wondering about some of the feelings I was having about Lee and whether they were ones that you wanted me to have as a reader, um, whether I liked them or not, whether I um, felt sorry for them or not, whether they made me sad. Um, and I, I wonder how you think about that. As you were conjuring Lee, what do you want your readers to think about them? Did you feel sorry for them? I felt sad for the pain they were carrying around. Mm. Did you like them? <laughs> no, I did not like them. <laughs> I thought they were a jerk. <laughs> They're very hard to like. <laughs> um, I don't know if I wanted people. I think they're a difficult character. They're a difficult person to like. I want that to not get in the way of the political problems that they represent and also their humanity. It's very easy to dehumanize a bad person or an evil person. It's very, very easy. And I think that we have to resist that at every opportunity. And that doesn't mean a world without violence or a world without retribution or holding people accountable or whatever. But the second that someone is no longer a human, you have carte blanche to do whatever you want to them. And it's, that is a very leaky, porous kind of concept because then you can just apply it to other people. It's a very, very dangerous thing, I think. But would you want Lee in your life? Would you block Lee on your phone? Um, no, I would not want Lee in my life. There have been Lees in my life. I have exhibited Lee behaviors in my life. I would hope that Lee would get into some good therapy. Unfortunately, that is sh very difficult for most people to access, um, especially if you're somebody like Lee. I would give Lee a copy of Sarah Shulman's Conflict is Not Abuse. <laughs> I wouldn't expect them to read it, but you never know. That's a good answer. Mm. So I, would, I would give Lee some reading. <laughs> yeah, lots of reading. Yeah. And hope for the best. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again to Davy Davis. Their book, X, is out now, and they also write a weekly newsletter and mutual aid fundraiser at itsdavid.substack.com. All right, this episode was produced by Liam McBain and edited by Jessica Mendoza and Quinn O'Toole. We had engineering help from Hannah Copeland. Of course, come back here for more It's Been a Minute on Friday. For that, we want to hear the best thing that happened to you all week. Record yourself and email the file to us at ibam at npr.org. That's I-B-A-M at npr.org. And you can find my regular show, Death, Sex, and Money, at deathsexmoney.org or wherever you listen to podcasts. Until Friday, thanks for listening. I'm Anna Sale. <laughs>